folks. Hi everyone. I'm really excited and happy to introduce Boyd Lee to the center. Uh, this this uh, Friday, we've been trying to get her here for a year and a half, for a year, I mean, <laughs> some kind of COVID period. <laughs> we were just talking about how strangely time went by, so we haven't seen each other actually in quite a long time. Barrett is Associate Professor of Southeast Asian Art History and Visual Culture in the Department of History and Art and Visual Culture at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Previous to that, she spent five years as an Assistant Professor of Art History at the University of Utah, and she's held postdoctoral fellowships um, as a Rockefeller Fellow at the University of Washington, and visiting professorships at the University of Hawaii and the University of Oregon. She received her PhD from Berkeley in 2003 with a dissertation on visual narrative and Angkorian temple art. Her latest book is called, or here it is, uh, Traces of Trauma, Visual Culture of Cambodia and National Identity in the Aftermath of Genocide, which was just published in 2021. She also co-edited with Nora Taylor a very well-known volume on modern and contemporary art in Southeast Asia, um, well-known and, and well-regarded um, volume. That was one of the kind of first volumes to come out on contemporary Southeast Asian art. She's published numerous scholarly and public-facing interviews and exhibition catalogs and essays. Her various essays and interviews focus on Cambodian visual culture from Angkorian motifs in stone to contemporary art installations, Southeast Asian film, gender, the body, Theravada Buddhism, the VMK, which is the Cambodian version of the Ramayana, heritage and art re repatriation, trauma, and the legacies of the Cambodian genocide and the Vietnam War. As you might sur surmise from these topics, Barrett is unusual for the temporal range and breadth of her scholarly work. This impressive range is amply represented in her fabulous recent book, Traces of Trauma, that helps us understand distinctive Cambodian ways of embodying, expressing, diagnosing, and con conceptualizing the trauma of gen genocide. She uses contemporary Cambodian art as a lens for finding and seeing the emergence of these post-Khmer Rouge period Cambodian traces and fragments of trauma in contemporary Cambodian society. If you, like me, have been trying to understand how human beings live with and process the experience of genocide, this book offers brilliant insights into these kinds of large questions, not just about Cambodians specifically, but about human beings. Today, Barrett is going to walk us through some ideas connected to her newest project of Rice and Roses, Preliminary Thoughts on Critical Pleasure and the Philosophy of Sabai. So let's welcome Barrett and help her think of these new thoughts. Can you hear me? Great. Thank you for that warm introduction, and, um, and thank you, uh, Mary, for, um, for all, making all the arrangements. And my little angel came <laughs> with the technology. I'm completely, <laughs> I'm very nervous about technology in general. Um, but anyway, so you can hear, you will hear about it a little bit today. Um, but also thank you for the invitations um, to come and share my uh, research with you. Um, so this is, I hope you get some pleasure out of it, it's about pleasure. <laughs> um, but anyway, so my talk then, uh, it's, um, let me preface the talk by saying that the topic of today's talk, first of all, is work in progress. Um, it is something that, it's one of the projects I'm working on and thinking about for a number of years now. And um, this is the post-publication of the book, uh, Traces of Trauma. Um, you know, ideas that emerge from it. And um, so the, the, the topic of my day, today's talk, by the way, um, this is the first paper, the first time I read a paper in years now. So I'm, I'm, I'm being good. I script myself, but because normally I'm all over the map with the PowerPoint, because the PowerPoint helped me hook the ideas and the image. Um, because, and also I've been spoiled by Zoom. Um, 
Okay, I'm wearing pants, not my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the, 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 topic, the, 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 the topic of my talk today, the philosophy of idea and critical pleasure, stems from the distillation of ideas that have arisen in, my, in post publication of my book, Traces of Trauma. that appeared in 2021, one of the insights that I gained from writing my book was the Khmer, the Khmer understanding of trauma, as that's why the word is on the screen. That is, uh, it means that the broken body lead, leading to this broken spirit. A traumatized body and mind need mending. How then does one go about healing the, the broken body so that life becomes more bearable? Moreover, how and when does one one get moments to heal the broken body if our jobs are increasingly more demanding of our time. Sadly, the global pandemic has added more layers of alienation and stress to our daily life. Second, since the invitation comes from the, the Center for South Asian Studies, the Department of Art History and History Department, um, it is timely to, uh, to engage folks with the expertise in different cultures and nations in Southeast Asia and beyond in a comparative uh, uh, perspective on uh, the topic of trauma, healing, pleasure, and happiness. Speaking of time, a few months ago, I invited a colleague of mine for tea at my home in Santa Cruz. We had a delightfully long conversation over tea and pumpkin custard. I, met, I got out of the way to make it. I'm a terrible cook, so don't count on it. The conversation was filled with belly laughs. The next day, I, I received an email from a message from her, quote, Oh my God, I cannot believe we spent four hours together. Next time, we can set a timer, unquote. Spontaneously, I replied, No, I'm Khmer. I don't live life like that, unquote. Of course, I did not at first give much thought to to my re reaction to, to what I meant by I'm Khmer. I don't live life like that. The idea of requiring workers to punch the clock and measure their productivity in earning hourly, hourly age, uh, wages probably began in the Industrial Revolution, as suggested by these two photographs that I found in the archive. Here is not exactly punching the clock, but it's about um, in the 19th century. You can see that from the 1930s. Um, these are the photographs dated from 1900 to 1941, just to provide you with the context about time. Um, this is a um, this is called a knock up, so you don't need an alarm clock. You can just hire one. They pay you, pay them a little. They'll come and wake you up and you know knock on your window, right? And um, this lady, um, the name is Mary Smith. She earned six pence a week shooting um, 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 peas at sleeping workers, you know. So they should shoot peas up your windows and you know wake you up so you won't take for class, okay? So this is um, how um, the industrial uh, time and work with, um, time was regulated. <clears throat> An article, um, excuse me, um, there was a, uh, that, um, that was how labor, capital, and industrial time was regulated. This surveillance of labor and productivity continue to be made manifest in the current shift, the digital time, which we are all part of, that is the algorithm. The algorithm. An article appeared in the New York Times on August 14, 2022, that discussed the problem of digital surveillance of workers and the insensitive computer program that neglects the budget time for workers' bathroom breaks. You can see here. Broadly speaking, um, the cultures of Southeast Asia do not evoke images of La Dolce Vita, a hedonistic lifestyle made famous by Federico Bellini's 1960 film, La Dolce Vita, The Sweet Life, that is set in Rome. Now, speaking of Roman, speaking of Rome, the modern Romans are famous for being lazy my kind of people, okay? Um, in fact, there are eight, um, if not more, so, uh, sayings uh, recounting how they cheerfully dismiss the importance of work in their daily lives. One, love your bed as you love yourself. If you feel like working, sit down, wait, go pass. <laughs> Nobody has ever died from, from too much rest. I like that one very much. That's a good answer to your dean, to you know, your professor, right? Whoever, whoever invented hard work died a long time ago. <laughs> Rest during the day so that you can sleep at night. If, some, if, if you see somebody's resting, let them be. Don't do today what you can do tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so these, uh, and of course in Sweden, 
right? Uh, you have the um, 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 the citizens uh, aspire to, to live their lives based on the principle of lago. Um, the term means not much, not too much, not too little, the right amount, and describe a Swedish way of life that seeks balance um, between works and leisure. My talk, to, my, my talk is in part about time, culture, aesthetics, healing, emotion, and the erotic of everyday life in Cambodian culture and in Southeast Asia in, at large. I will investigate the etymology of the Khmer terms for happiness and pleasure, and demonstrate how they reflect an Indic concept of the, the erotic and emotions. Moreover, I will analyze the specific films and the lyrics of specific, specific Khmer pop songs from the 1960s to engage you in how uh, the experience of pleasure is played out. Furthermore, I will turn to the writing of the late Audrey Lord, an African-American feminist, and her exploration of the use of the erotic to reclaim a local Cambodian epistemology of pleasure. I argue that the reclaiming of this local understanding of the erotic, being happy, is part of the healing of the broken body as a political resistance to speed and global capitalism. We need rice, but we also need to smell the roses. Last, how might the culture of Cambodia and Southeast Asia at large contribute to the emerging studies uh, of critical pleasure uh, and activism in the US and around the world? Here you have a book, um, um, you know, a very popular book by Adrian Murray Brown, and of course I'll, I'll, I'll discuss Audrey Lord's work um, momentarily that I have mentioned that comes to mind. The cultures of Southeast Asia, in particular Cambodia and its diaspora, do not evoke images of, um, of Lagum and, and or the, the Dolce Vita under the Tuscan sun, but more likely the image of war, genocide, political conflicts, military dictatorship under the tropical sun. Moreover, since the colonial encounters, natives have been considered lazy and thus incapable of participating in the industrial workforce. An article written by James um, Markham titled Letter from Laos appeared in the New York Times on August 23rd, 25th, 1974. It begins with the colonial slanders about the lazy natives in former Indochina. The Vietnamese grow rice, you can see here, quote, the, the Vietnamese grow rice, the Khmer watch rice grow, the Lao listen to the rice grow. Okay, so this is the hierarchy of laziness. The Vietnamese work harder, the Khmer in the middle, and the Lao are the most lazy because you know, they just sit there and listen to the rice one. Okay, so um, I lost my track. And um, so the author goes on to argue that, quote, somewhere in this jolly colonial slender, fashioned by some anonymous French wit, lies a grain of truth that helps to explain why the kingdom of Laos is at peace, why its Indo Chinese neighbor, Vietnam and Cambodia, remain at war. So, uh, unquote. The stereotype, this stereotyping of the natives and, um, and the denial of um, coevenness between the, the West and the rest has been critiqued by uh, Johann Fabians um, in his 1983 book, The Time and the Other, how anthropological make, uh, anthropology make its object. Similar post-colonial critique have been put forward by the late Stuart Hall and Edward Said in their respective writings. Indeed, there are pains and suffering to be reckoned with in Cambodia, in Cambodia and Southeast Asia, and around the globe for that matter. But ultimately, it is about the politics of visual remontations and the ethic of uh, mediation or as intervention. I want to make clear at the outset that I'm not claiming that Cambodians gain pleasure from experience, the experience of trauma, pain, and suffering. I would like to go beyond what is commonly known as, the, as porn pain. Oh, just to uh, show you very quickly another a major book written about by uh, the late um, um, uh, uh, Halatus, uh, 1977, on this lazy myth, um, uh, addressing the myth in this, of course, a classic in anthropology. Um, I want to make I want to go beyond what is commonly referred to as porn pain, mm -hmm. but that is a, a one-sided perspective that Susan Sontag called regarding the pain of others captured by these images by uh, American photographers. Um, just to show you, these are images that you're familiar with, or those of you engage with Southeast Asia. This is something that you engage with. Um, not that it's written, but not serious. It is, but um, um, I just want to focus on something else. I want to explore local understanding of fun, pleasure, and the erotic of everyday life. A 
a, a counter filmic narrative that is an assertion of a political and, and ethical perspective to remedy these racial stereotypes of Cambodia and her people as uncivilized, barbaric, and violence is found in the films described um, um, directed by the late King Norodom Sihanou. Rumor has it that the late King, uh, King, uh, King, King Father Sihanou, was angry and disappointed at the Orientalist uh, depiction of Cambodia, of Cambodia in Richard Brooks' film, um, 1965 film, uh, Lord Jim, starring Peter O'Toole. Um, the, film, the film Lord Jim is based on a novel of the same name by Joseph Conrad. Parts of Brooks' film was shot at the temple and uh, on Go. Cambodia is betrayed um, again. As they, you know, you can see here Peter O'Toole on, um, uh, you know, on, on site uh, filming the screen. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to discuss this film because due to the country of time, I just want to bring it in as part of my discourse. Um, so, uh, subject uh, Cambodia is, is portrayed in the film as violent, trapped in superstition, and unmodern. Subsequently, the late King Father produced, wrote, and, and directed. His 1960, um, 1966 film, Apsara, yeah. um, starring his daughter, Princess Noro Rampapadevi, as an Apsara court dancer, to provide a more civilized, modern image to counter the, this orientalist depiction of the Khmer and Cambodia in, in Lord Jim. Apsara, just a few seconds. She's in the car. Uh, the opening, of uh, the long shot of the opening, um, is uh, Sachi's bound. Despite um, so, despite that he falls back to the plot. Despite that he falls in love with with with, with um, uh, Kantana, played by the Royal Lumpur Party V, uh, rising a uh, ravishing um, star of the Royal Ballet, played by again Princess by Party V. Now, in retrospect, what is so brilliant? Um, you know, let's, can we play the other one, please? Yes, I can. Thank you. This is the. Um, the challenge of present doing something with multimedia. So this is how they be on the screen. <laughs>
the park, um, uh, French uh, layout of park in front of uh, um, the Mon City is um, the, the tree is still pretty young. I know because I grew up in that neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> it's my age, those trees. <laughs> They're gone now, they you plant them. You can see that in the other fountain. Does it not evoke something for you? This is the um, building. We call it building in those days. It has been demolished, that building. And you can see the trees here, baby trees. Okay. The film begins with an opening, distant shot of, car, of a car driven by a modern and sexy Khmer woman, played by uh, um, past, past the independent monument in Phnom Penh. It was built in 1958 to mark Cambodia's independence from France in 1953. The second clip, clip gives viewer a tour of the newly constructed city of Phnom Penh. Many of the buildings were designed by Cambodian architects and city planners, especially one Mali one who uh, passed away in 2017. But on the screen, I just want to show you that this is Satsi Baon. Um, she uh, was a very well-known and She basically is the, um, the 1960 Khmer version of Rishi Bakdo, for those of you who remember, you know, um, the ravishing beauty. And um, it's very racy, like the La Joie de Vie, but I will show you later. Um, but anyway, she just passed, she passed away yesterday at the age of 82 in Spain. So may, 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 may she rest in peace. Okay, so I just want to celebrate that because I mean it marked another the end of another of an era of that generation of the pre-war generation. Okay, so just want to point that out. Um, the second clip clips it gives you a tour of the newly constructed city of Phnom Penh, as I said earlier. Indeed, Phnom Penh is the ideal city, a concept developed in the Renaissance that harkens back to the, in the, to the description of the ideal city written by Plato and Aristotle. There are a few paintings that depict this ideal city, and here is one by Fra um, Cannavale, dated to um, between 14, 1480 and 1484. We see the use of a single, single vanishing point perspective um, in Cannavale's painting to render this ideal city. Let's see here fountain and the idea that the usage of mathematic um, and science to construct a space, a city. Um, conceptually, paintings of the ideal city capture utopian ideals that can be achieved and more metaphorically through architecture and city planning as an allegory of good government that ensures spiritual and morally just space for its citizens. So this is what I'm trying to point out that, you know, I, his scene is very clever. His film, we used to dismiss as you know something that is so narcissistic. He, he you know like a family family film. He um, you know his circle. He put his children in them. But I think we need to have a rereading of this. This is quite powerful. Um, that's my what I'm trying to point out here. Likewise, it seems that he wants to showcase his ideal city of Phnom Penh, constructed under his political regime that was caused in Gum um, and Rinium. Um, social, uh, people's socialist community of post-independence. Cambodia was a modern city that was planned and built by local Khmer architects and engineers. Moreover, Cambodia is historically uh, an agrarian society. Um, and thus, you can see the river. We are river and land people. We are not ocean. Ocean came later. Okay? Um, so, um, I'm speaking to Southeast Asian studies, so I'm going to move fast. I'm not going to, you know, do the geography thing, okay? Is that okay, everyone? Right. You know, because I've been, you know, this professor thing in the classroom for so many years now, you know, my students are personally don't understand. Where is that? Okay. So if you don't, just Google, okay? Uh, so uh, let's see. Moreover, Cambodia is historically an agrarian society, and that's the lives of its citizens were and perhaps still are still, uh, still are sustained by river, orchards, and wet, wet rice farming. Despite this transformation of and modernization of Phnom Penh, from a village to a cosmopolitan metropolis, its inhabitants continue to carry on with a village way of life. Life in the post-colonial metropolis was, at least in filmic orientation, 
I happily, I happily feel um, um, a, a pleasure, a, a light period with pleasure. In fact, um, so just to show you, you know, the web is farming. You're familiar with this already, in, but just to point it out. Now, um, in in fact, in 1968, you know, make another film called Joie de Vivre, Road I Survive, in 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 Khmer, literally mean live by happiness or live happily. But but sometimes it is translated as the good life. And here I want us to make a distinction between a good life with the good life, right? Because we often think about here about Buddhism and all forms of you know with this uh, prescribed way of morally sound and ethical life is a good life. This is the the good life. <laughs> anyway, so um, um, so basically, La Joie de Vivre is basically it's about uh, you know live uh, to, to live with joy or you know in in, in French. Um, is a, a comedy, a farce, um, starring again Zazie Spang, one of his favorite actress, um, as Princess of Power, and her relationship with men who are obsessed with power, corruption, love, and money. What else is there? Captain Suppers, because <laughs> the, the plot goes like this very quickly. Again, nothing to write home about in terms of plot, but that's not what we care about. We care about something else, right? Captain Suppers uh, and Inspector some pot, some, uh, some bond, raid the gambling. Uh, um, the gambling uh, place at Gorirum, owned by Prince uh, Jintao Wong. This place is disguised as an orchid shop. So in the beginning, you see that this guy is an orchid shop, but in actually, it's a it's a, a gambling you know den where people go and secretly gamble. Um, as 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 soon as Prince uh, Jintao Wong was detained in jail, his wife, that is Princess um, Yansupa, Princess again played by Sasi Bao, spent her, her time with her, with having a love a love a, a love relationship with her nephew. Uh, so, you know, as soon as her husband got to jail, she immediately hooked up with her nephew. Quotation nephew, okay? <laughs> uh, and then um, she meets Oknya Snai Hap Sambat. I love this name. Oknya Snai Hap Sambat is like a grown Ok Ochil Ye. He's very rich. And in Khmer, you know, that girl is laughing. Oknya Snai Hap Sambat, meaning, you know, the, the, the big shop who loves um, uh, wealth, right? For Sambat, okay? I mean, this is very. This is seen who wrote all this, by the way. He's very clever. I mean, you gotta give him some credit, right? This is the Moliere and the Shakespeare, right? <laughs> so I, I, I can't believe it. So spends a, a time having a love a, again, a relationship with the nephew. Um, uh, then Ognia takes her, her to a big island. As you know, we can see the film yourself on YouTube. After being re um, uh, being released from prison, Prince Tavong, uh, armed with gun, tried to look uh, very way for her. So ended up she had to make a choice at the way end, whether she go with you know um, her former husband or she um, you know she she um, uh, she divorced him. So she ended up you know of course staying with him. Um, again, there isn't much weight in the story because it's it's about lightness, happiness, silliness, sunshine, beaches, food, and sex. The film ends with everybody living happily or or finding love, if not love or fortune. What is most relevant to my talk is the story helps us to define and thus transcend, to understand, excuse me, what, what, what's most, what is most relevant to my talk is that the story helps us define and thus understand the Khmer concept of pleasure and happiness. There are two interrelated Khmer terms for pleasure, sabai di ri or pi di ri. You can see here. Um, so by derived from uh, Pali, you can see here, means um, supaya, meaning likely beneficial, fit, um, suitable, etc. You can read it yourself. And then the second term is um, um, read, uh, read, read, is a Khmer, um, the, the, the opposite word is the word read. Why do we, for example, in English, we don't think about happy being expand, blossom, read, right? What is that all about? Where is that coming from? You know, and this is something that I want to get at momentarily. But first, let us look at the word survive and how survive, um, survive uh, played out. Okay, so this is survive, and I, I don't know Lao or Thai, don't let me fool you. <laughs> this is coming directly from the dictionary, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so you judge for yourself. This is the advantage of just speaking to an audience, um, you know, of Southeast Asian study, because language training is hell, as you know, right? So, um, um, so we're blessed with that knowledge. Um, so the sight and sound of of of, um, of Zabai is captured in the lyrics um, of modern pop, Khmer pop song from the 1960s. It is worth noting here that the Khmer, pop, uh, Khmer popular song were composed for dances such as the Rambong, uh, Rong Khmer, uh, slow dance. Sarawan was reinvented in post-independence Cambodia. 
in the 1969 and 1970s, Latin dances such as the mambo, the cha cha cha, um, as well as the American Madison, were imported to Cambodia. These dances were popular during uh, festive occasions such as wedding, New Year's, and other celebrations. We also know of two dance clubs in Phnom Penh that were popular among the urbanites. That they don't do the do, do, do a floating club situated um, on the river near um, the old market in Phnom Penh, and Nan Yuin located near the Royal Palace. There are more, but um, you know I'm still trying to look at the archive um, to all interview because there were uh, different clubs that people go to. Um, you know, to I just want to say that these that this song are not simply for listening on radio, but they were also, and when, people, when the singers thing, they would announce, oh, okay, this is a cha cha cha, this is a rumble, you know. So they announce because people sometimes don't know how to dance, they don't, you know, so they did they, they did it wrongly, so they would make an announcement. Popular songs played on the radio were accessible to all people of social classes, especially in the countryside. In brief, these songs provide Cambodians with an imagined community. Here I sing one two songs, uh, How My Husband Is Gone, and May My Fight Dong, you know, um, Thrice Widow, uh, 1967 and 1968, respectively, sung by the late Ban Ron, um, because frankly, she is one of my favorites, my goddess. So you, you suffer to it because of me. <laughs> Moreover, I think the lyrics written by the late Wei Ho shed light on the Khmer concept of home, home life, gender, sexuality, fun, and pleasure. Ban Ron was one of the most versatile singers of the Khmer pop, of Khmer pop, pop, pop music in the 1960s and 70s. She was born on February 8, 1944 in Baden Bong and um, came from a musical family. Her father was a professor of music and her sibling were also, um, um, you know, um, a, 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 a joining her in, in, in singing and popping in different clubs. Sadly, she was killed under the Khmer regime. The first song um, is a cha-cha-cha, and the second song is a rom -bong. So that's what I'm going to play for you now. So this is um, Ben Ruan. We don't really know much about her, about her unfortunately. Very little know about her. This is the lyrics that I translate, but by Kim Howie, uh, uh, my husband is gone. And here's my rough translation on the screen. So let me read it to you. <clears throat> now, the, re the, be the beauty about this song and the sexy why I'm so gravitated with them, because they're not simply songs that you get up and you sing. They are um, they're narrative, they're story, and they're usually like a little sketch of a scene, of a character from a village. It's very wonderful in terms of, you know, they give us basically a window into the social world of gender and sexuality, gender relation, home, home life, etc. And you'll see when I play the song for you, um, this is, um, we're, we're now in the world of gender binary. We are not non-binary, okay? Because, I mean, it is an agrarian society. The force of, pre, um, you know, procreation and fertility is everything. <laughs> Asexual is not a good thing. No, the the universe doesn't grow. So in this case, you know, so you know, this ultra ultra femme, you know, if you I, I a clue in into gender theory, but what I mean by femme, right? Her voice is really you know hit almost like an octave when she speak. Even she sounds like a cat scratching and screeching. You you hear in a second, right? And then she go like this. And also this is all a period of when the Khmer speak French. It's not French French, it's Khmer French, right? So you see her accent and also the use of words are pretty much can only make sense within the community of Khmer people at that particular moment. <laughs> so um, if she says the French, it would alter a different meaning. For example, she said, my husband is always feeling exhausted. One day he said, he's busy at the office, back when all, okay? And on another day he said, he's busy advising, consigné. On yet another day he said, he's obligated to attend a banquet. Again, he said, he's busy running his bureaucratic affairs. And then she starts singing after that, right? She, first of all, she lament, you know, she lament about her husband being gone. And she knows that he's lying, right? He make up all these excuses. God knows what he's doing, you know? He's never home. So she starts singing, my husband is gone. Folks, have you seen my husband lately? He's always having fun, out having fun. He's always out having fun. He hasn't been, been, been able to stay home for a day. He doesn't have time to go to the movie or theater. He only likes drinking and womanizing. When he couldn't find his honey, he came home and it's abusive to his wife. Ever since I was born, this is the first time I encountered such a husband. Whoever listens to me, um, 
Excuse me, he never listens to me. He's always drunk and carefree. Oh Lord Buddha, please help me. My goal has prayer in, in this lifetime. He is out, he's, 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 he's out all the time. If any one of you run into him, please tell him to come home. Okay, so let me play you a little bit. So the lyrics of this 1969 song tells the story of this of a distressful wife in a small village of town with neighbors no one another's business. What we are hearing is that a, that fun and sexual pleasure um, can be carried out by any married or single man if, if, if the activity is outside the home. In Khmer culture, the space of the home is where moral and ethical rights are preserved and protected from corruption. It is usually the wife and the mother who guards and protects her home from any kind of moral aberration. Thus, a man can go survive as long as he doesn't bring it home, you know? Um, and usually you have to perform some sort of exorcist if you bring all the jablai in the home, right? So, you know, so this is very important when we think about, right? That's why um, when we think about gender theory, uh, for example, a man could have any kind of sexual pleasure with woman, man, non-binary, you name it, but they don't attach an identity. You see what I mean? For example, if, if, if a husband, someone's husband goes and sleep with a boy or man out, outside the home, he does not immediately think, oh, am I gay? Because the whole thing is about pleasure. It's about I. See? For American, immediately you have a major crisis. Oh my God, you know? You know? So this is very different in this context, right? So um, the next one is um, another song from 1967. is called um, A Thrice Riddle. Uh, may, my, may my way gone. Um, and the lyric goes, um, when I turned 16, my mother um, uh, suddenly married me off. At that time, I was still green, and based on my whims, I, did, I divorced him. I became a widow for the first time. 10 years later, she has a 10 years age, okay? 10 years later, I got married again. By then, I had great, I had great experience, but he was so old that was always have, out having fun. See, she's out having fun. She's not having fun at all. She's out having fun. She was so, he was so old that he died. I became a widow for the second time. By then, I was 36 and he was 25. Um, excuse me. I became a widow for the second time, okay? And then 10 years later, I got married again. By then, I was, I was 36 and he was 25 years old. I loved and cuddled him for one year. But due to my bad karma, he divorced me. I became a widow for the third time, and now my reputation is defiled. Defi I have no more husband. Okay. Now this is very clever. You notice that all the the, the mathematic of it here is calculated, very precise, right? To create that kind of that sense of humor. Can we um, let's see, uh, play this, yeah. please? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm 
anything. I don't have time to analyze the music and all that because I'm now interested in just the lyrics and how they play out. Uh, it sounds like she has a 10 year itch, all uh, joking aside, that's what I'm referring to. Um, we will revive this uh, 1955 uh, uh, film uh, with uh, starring Marilyn Monroe. Uh, we noticed that she turned when she, when, um, when she turned 26, um, she had gained more experience so that she was always have, out having fun and neglected her very old and decrepit husband. Subsequently, he died from neglect. And this abuse of her husband contributed to her bad karma and accounts for her young stud divorcing her. See, cause and effect, right? You know, so um, in brief, based on the lyrics of these two songs, both men and women in Khmer society in the 1960s could have fun and pleasure outside the home. The home functioned as the nucleus of the family and as long as a partner did not bring their fun home, they could seek whatever pleasure outside their primary relationship. This can include love affairs, gambling, etc. As I mentioned earlier, the Khmer term for this is one of that brings me to it. The Khmer term, let's see. The Khmer term for pleasure is Rigli. And this is the definition of Rigli, you can see here. Um, um, uh, you know, to, to blossom, to bloom, to burst, Rig, Rig. And then to develop, to inflate, to swell. You know, like, like um, um, I'll show you some example in a second. So, um, and this is basically subsequent meanings. Um, tradi again, traditional Cambodia, uh, as I said, uh, this is um, uh, images that I would show if uh, asking uh, you know, what we consider to be a really pleasure. Uh, this would I think, align kind of, you know, if we talk about poetry and, and, and painting or poetry and image, right? This would be the word how it match up to um, align with um, when we think of. Um, I want to ask to all of you, when you think of pleasure, what can your image come to mind? you know, for the respective cultures and places you work with or in your own personal life, you know? Well, keep it yourself. <laughs> no. But anyway, so this is, um, um, maybe the wrong question there. <laughs> uh, it is a river, uh, um, um, you know, so it's a um, 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 traditional Cambodia is an agrarian society again. It is a river and land culture where rice farming and our orchards provided the main source of food for villagers. Hence, life is an agrarian society, is governed by seasonal changes and rice growing um, cycles. What is interesting um, is the word, uh, the Khmer word, the the blossom, the bloom, the burst, etc. Comparable to nature, the feeling of pleasure, the erotic stem from the growth, scent, sensuality of nature. In visual terms, um, how is pip ritli or ritli made manifest? And these would, I would show this, um, um, for example, you know, the sort of uh, verdant, um, 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 a wet rice, right, growing, dotted with triple palm, and then um, a pomegranate, this is, don't have to be any fruit you can name, um, burst with seeds, right, on the tree. This would be um, considered to be a pleasure, you know, um, and when a, um, a flower bloom, called kari, right, the, the, you know, the flower bloom. So, these photographs capture that. Um, and then, the, you know, also think about the rainy season on this, uh, because there's only two seasons, uh, dry and, and rainy season. All forms of life, including frogs, insects, fishes, participate in the fertile moment of growth. Um, just for those of you who want the authentic flower, you know, the, the roses come from Persia, I know. So I give you the rule just to shut you up. <laughs> the pure type, okay? Uh, um, so, Another example of the fruit and the tree, as I said, they're burst with seeds and, and, and scent. Now, what is this all about? Not surprisingly, the, the, word, the, the Khmer word, not surprisingly, the Khmer word for taste, that is the taste of, um, you know, taste of, 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 taste in, of the taste of food, is ruchit. Um, that is possibly derived from the Sanskrit rasa. Here. It means nectar, essence, or taste. It's an Indian aesthetic theory codified in the Nasa Shastra, a dance treaty written by Bharata roughly in the first century, and later elaborated by Abhinagupta, a Shaiva philosopher. There are a total of nine emotions in, in um, the Indian context. So this is just poetry, it's the, the scent of the soul, which is rasa. Rasa in, in Sanskrit would be juice, essence, flavor, um, taste. Basically, condense something that condense, you know, like the way we taste food. Food as a metaphor for motion. This is the nine rasa. 
Um, but what I'm interested in, again, is the Schrindler Alaska, the erotic sentiment, the very top, okay? So, um, and also food play a major role in Indian, um, in Hindu practice. And so this is a temple I visited many years ago um, in Orissa, called the Ananda Vasudeva Temple in Orissa. They are roughly twice century, but today they still cook these food as offering to the gods, Kapasan. Uh, so um, you can actually, you know, um, it's because it's part of the religious really Alasa. So, let's see. This Indic this Indic derived local Khmer understanding of the erotic life and emotion aligns with a mirrored with a, a, a mirrors the theory of erotic proposed by the late Audrey Lord, a feminist activist and poet laureate. She theorized the erotic in her um, essay titled Uses of, of the Erotic, Erotic as Power, published in 1978. Uh, Lord defines the erotic by acknowledging the etymology of the term hak as hakan back to the Greek, eros, a personification of love and all aspect. For Lord, the erotic is a resource within each of us that lies in a deeply female and spiritual plane, firmly rooted in the power of our unexpressed and recognized feeling. The erotic is a measure between the beginnings of our sense of self and chaos of our strongest feelings. It is an internal sense of satisfaction to which once we experience, where we have experienced the fullness of the depth of the of feeling, recognizing its power and honor and self-respect, we can require no less of ourselves." unquote. She concludes her thoughts, her thought and understanding of the, the erotic as, quote, when I'm speaking of the erotic, when I'm speaking of the erotic, uh, when I'm speaking of the erotic, then I speak of an, of an assertion of, of the life force of woman that creative energy empowered, the knowledge and use of which we are now reclaiming in our language, our history, our dancing, our loving, our work, our lives, unquote. As a black lesbian, lesbian feminist of her generation, Lord makes a clear distinction between the erotic and the pornographic. For her, the erotic is about true feeling, while the pornography is about sensation. More importantly, according to Lord, it was patriarchy that, re that, that reproduced the erotic as pornography. Considering the evolving theories of gender and sexuality in the U.S. and proclivity for, for a move towards the non-binary, uh, Lord's binary, binary perspective on gender and sexuality might seem outdated. But I find her permanent perspective on the erotic aligns with traditional Indian theory of emotions and aesthetics, fertility, and abundance. Moreover, the Khmer word roti, the taste for food and the lust for life, is grounded in gender binary of an agrarian culture and the procreation of union of the male and the female that sustain life cycle and see no changes. In the context of Cambodia and in Theravada, Southeast Asia, I know I'm generalizing a bit here. One might argue that the marginalization of women and fear of female sexuality by the patriarchal school, patriarch, patriarchal school of Theravada Buddhism has turned the erotic into pornography. And here I just want to point out very quickly as an aside that um, it's very interesting because the erotic has always been there, even in the, the, the Buddhic image, um, you know, based on the earlier textual recension. As you recall, in the biography of the Lord Buddha, uh, Queen Maya gave birth to the Buddha out the side and she held onto a tree, you see, right here. And this basically happened back to the ancient Indian um, you know, imagery of Yakshi, a tree spirit. And here you have um, Babumbahu Stupa. Um, she is placing a flower right on top of her womb, a genitalia. And there's a, a, a you know, folklore that has it that you know, if she kicks the tree three times, the tree will cause the tree to bloom, the blossom. You know. So and what I'm trying to say is that this, also the morphology, you know, this is I'm um, drawing by the the bit um, original the gore from the 19th century, but this continued that a local Indian understanding of of, of you know morphology of form, and here you have the Buddha image is we are supposed to understand the Buddha image when we look at the Buddha image. What are we supposed to why why does the Buddha image look look that way? There's an explanation because um, you know he was born when the Lord was born with 32 Lakshana. 
32 auspicious marks. And therefore, these, but my point is that, it, again, harken back to the erotic of nature, right? Um, you see them, you know, um, his eyes are the shape like, you know, a bullet drinking our fountain or um, a, a, a lotus butt. And his, his lips is right, and his neck is put to be a conch shell and you know, the, uh, the, the curl of his um, uh, uh, snail. Um, his is long, like the trunk of an elephant. And subsequently, you can see that um, his nose, for example, is supposed to mirror that of the, the beak of a parrot, etc., etc., of these 32 actioners. Okay? So you can see that all this is similarly metaphorical nature. It's part of that what I'm trying to talk about. Okay? Now, so um, let me conclude. It seems that there are two interrelated kind terms, namely Sabai and Rigri, or Sabai Rigri. And these experiences require, uh, are requirements for living, a ha li for living happily. I argue that we should, I should, um, that we should translate them as a living the good life and not a good life. Moreover, the changing season in an agrarian society and culture shape our understanding of the erotics of everyday life in Cambodia and perhaps in other parts of Southeast Asia. I know that among the Cambodian um, diaspora in the U.S., especially in the Central Valley of California, where many Khmer refugees settle, the area is referred to jokingly um, as a uh, soccer ping boy, you know, because that area, right? The ping boy are pretty much these um, um, uh, what prime, row, prime water, water roses. Yeah, because what they're referring to is like this is like the Bumpkin area, right? Central, and these are Khmer who live in Long Beach, California. They say they think they're so Los Angeles and urban. Right, so they prefer to the the the, the um, what you call it, you know, the land, vast land of Central Valley where they grow, right? You know, that's soccer big boy, okay? So um, um, I don't know what would you call the Midwest, you know? But I don't know. Anyway, I'm I'm, I'm Californian, uh, particularly by the urbanized um, diasporic mind in Los Angeles. And Central Valley is a major agri agricultural area. Kabin boy are water primroses. Um, um, they grow in the pond and lakes, and they're used to as medicine for cows. In brief, even though their lives were and are lived in an increasingly industrial society, the Khmer need to be survived, and they have never abandoned their agrarian roots. Sadly, in contemporary Cambodia, and in other parts of Southeast Asia, um, climate change attributed to global capitalism have made this traditional way of life unsustainable. For example, uh, today, fish um, in Cambodia, our traditional main source of protein, perhaps, is more expensive than chicken. Moreover, the, the local Khmer have been selling their lands so that they can participate in the tourist economy. When the pandemic arrived, the tourist industry came to a full stop, and many have no land to return to. They could not be self-sufficient because they sold all their land, right? And all the bank money, etc. Likewise, in the US and around the globe, there is a movement to counter global capitalism in order to save our planet. In the past decades, younger generations of Americans and Europeans have attempted to live a less materialistic lifestyle by going off-grid, living in tiny houses, starting their own farmstead, growing organic food. Maybe this is such a Californian thing, not the Midwest, I have no idea. Um, yeah, yeah, this idea of progress is the opposite of what constituted progress in civilization during the Industrial Age and under colonialism. The filmmaker, the current idea of living an environmentally, environmentally progressive uh, lifestyle echoes what the Thai filmmaker Apichapun has to say about primitivism in his 2020, uh, 2011 video installation of the same title. Quote: Another way we can look at the word prim primitive as a way to preserve the place, the agricultural community, like when you see in the dream in my two screen installation, when you listen to the dream, it becomes really a primitive society in the future. So utopian space does not have to be shiny and high tech, but maybe in the future utopian space come back to an agriculturally based society, unquote. I have discussed this um, concept in my 2019 article of Sense and Sensibility. The West has finally caught up with Southeast Asia. Um, in its search for an embodied lifestyle that is mindful of the environment e and ecosystems. I would like to provisionally conclude my talk with what Audrey Lord said about the need to reclaim the erotic in our lives. Quote, our erotic knowledge empowers us, become a lens through which we scrutinize our lives. And this is a great responsibility projected from each of us, not to settle for a convenient, the, con the conventionally expected, nor the merely safe, unquote. The practice 
And to experience the erotic of everyday life, one needs time, one needs to slow down, and more than significantly, one needs to resist what the state um, and global capitalism imposes upon us. Here, self-care and self-management proposed by the workplace and institution as means to sustain our physical and mental health is simply to maintain the labor force and keep the machine running. It is discipline and punishment, and thus not a solution. In short, we must resist. We need our rice, bread, couscous, whatever you name yourself, um, but we also need the smell of the roses. Last time, that abstract concept and, and idea, be it agrarian, industrial, or digital, has historically proven to be flexible and changing. Many have argued, that rather pessimistically, that we are all prisoners of the algorithm. I think Gangnam is better than everybody else, okay? The algorithm, we are trapped in it. And by the end of the day, it is a choice we have to make. Time, serve. time serves us, or we serve time. Finally, I would like to close this lecture um, with a, you know, um, um, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you.